Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be starting coverage of our 2014-2015 FIDE Grand Prix. It's four tournaments. If you're not too familiar with the high-level chess scene as far as tournaments go, I'm going to break it down. So feel free to fast forward if you don't want kind of a breakdown. So you have your major tournament, and that is the World Championship. This year, at the end of November, we're going to see Magnus Carlsen play Vichyanon. Magnus Carlsen won the championship last year, and the reason he's playing Vichyanon is Vichy actually won the Candidates Tournament. The Candidates Tournament uh, not being played every year, uh, but it's just kind of random when they play it. But the winner of the Candidates Tournament actually gets to play the defending champion, who's now Magnus Carlsen. So uh, it's very important to actually qualify for the Candidates Tournament. They don't have too many players. And next year, there'll actually be no Candidates Tournament. There'll actually be no World Championship. So we're going to have uh, 2015 is going to be more of a qualifying year. Now, now, the Grand Prix is a four-tournament series, and it starts right now, October 2nd through October 15th is the first one. Uh, there's going to be another one at the end of October, one in February, and then one in May. Now, of these four tournaments, uh, there's not too many individuals going to be playing, but the top two people in the Grand Prix get invited to the Candidates Tournament. So we also have kind of the World Cup where you can get invited to the Candidates Tournament. But this is going to be for the 2016 Candidates Tournament. And again, the winner of the, the 2016 Candidates Tournament uh, will then play in the 2016 World Championship versus whoever wins uh, Vichyanon or Magnus Carlsen. So, uh, this is extremely important. Although uh, it's just one tournament, it definitely will kind of set people up uh, for the next three tournaments. And you can actually only play three out of the four tournaments. So it gets kind of weird. All that to say is definitely one of the more important tournaments as it gears up for the Candidates Tournament coming up. So without further ado, our first match that we're going to be go over, going over in round one is two of the hottest young stars. White's going to be played by Sergei Kardiakin. Uh, he is 24 years old. He's the number eight ranked player in the world on the FIDE list. Uh, and his opponent playing the Black Pizzas is probably the hottest chess player right now um, as far as talent goes. He just had probably the most impressive tournament Arguably of all time, uh, if you haven't seen that, uh, playing against the best competition uh, ever put in a chess tournament. He won the first seven matches out of ten, uh, went 7-0-3 with three ties, uh, catapulted him to number two in the world. So Fabiano Carjuana is playing the black pieces. So really, really great match today between these two young stars of chess. Sergey starts out with the Queen's Gambit, and Cardhuana decides to go ahead and decline that, so pawn to e6. Uh, knight to c3, uh, bishop here to e7, bishop to f4. I definitely like this line. A lot of times you'll see pawn to e3 instead, kind of blocking off this pawn chain, but I feel like it's a lot easier to go ahead and get this dark square bishop involved. Uh, attacking and defending this middle of the board, these dark squares. So later he can play pawn here to e3, get his light square bishop, castle on the king side. Uh, so definitely like that. Castle on the king side for Carjuana. Then the rook over here to c1, giving some protection right here. Uh, knight to d7. Again, it's a little awkwardly placed. Can always play the pawn here to c6. Uh, somewhat of a passive defense right now. Just trying to feel out his opponent. Trying to see where Sergei wants to go. Uh, but again, Fabiano is in no rush. Um, you know, while this is blocking off his light square bishop, later on down the road, he's going to be looking to move this around. And then, depending on where he needs to, get his light square bishop involved into the game. Uh, pawn taking here. So all of a sudden, we see uh, an open, a semi-open file right here and a semi-open file for black. So that may lead to more complications or variations depending on how both sides actually want to continue. Uh, pawn to e3 as we talked about, opening up the door for this light square bishop. Uh, pawn to c6, solidifying this pawn chain for black. Uh, pawn to h3, just making sure there's nothing crazy that goes on with knight here to g4. Uh, making sure that later on this bishop's not going to come down to g4, pinning down this knight. Uh, we see knight to e4. So black's really trying to control the e4 square, these light squares in the center of the board and black's trying to do the opposite he's trying or white's trying to control the e5 square and the dark squares in the center of the board uh, bishop to uh, d3 
trying to attack uh, this pawn or this knight here on e4 more than anything just trying to allow his king to castle on the king side uh, knight to f6 again adding more defenses on this knight here to e4 castle on the king side and then bishop to f5 again both sides recognizing their strengths and weaknesses uh, and right now black's just trying to solidify the strength here on e4 so from here we see the knight come back here to e2 wasn't doing too much here on c3 uh knight coming back here to d7 um again black has more than ample protection here with the knight here on e4 we now have queen here to b3 again this is kind of a carlsbad pawn structure i'm actually going to make another video on the carlsbad pawn structure but typically that's when you have uh, a semi-open file for both sides so we have a semi-open file for white here on the c file semi-open file for black here on the e file and then it's kind of blocked in the center of the board with these pawn structures so you can't really make anything of it uh, so I i'm going to make a separate video on how to actually attack that it usually rises from the queen's pawn opening so pawn to d4 that's typically more of a closed game where e4 is more of a an open game because your your bishop and your queen can get out very easily uh, but this is more closed so usually when you see these crawl bad pawn structures they are going to come from a queen pawn opening we see the queen to b6 um, there's a few options that sergey has uh, he can retreat his queen he can also take with his queen it's probably a little more awkward if he takes with his queen uh, then we see the pawn take here on b6 uh, the rooks attacking so this rook can get easily involved into the game so pawn to a3 uh, pawn to b5 it's just kind of awkward for white uh, he loses a lot of control on the queen side uh, the king side he probably has a small disadvantage and so no real reason to make that exchange. Instead, decide just to go ahead and bring his queen back here to c2. Uh, it's still very much involved into the game, controlling the semi-open file, also adding another attacker on the square here on e4. So we see the bishop come back here to uh, g6. Uh, bishop coming back here to h2. So both sides kind of retreating their bishops a little bit. Uh, rook here to e8. Uh, black now getting ready to just add a little bit more protection with this semi-open file. Both sides recognizing that they need to control that. That is a a strength for both sides. Uh, knight to f4. And this is kind of interesting because this bishop is now going to fall for the most part. Uh, so instead of trying something cute black recognizes that he will probably lose his bishop and he plays bishop here to d6 which is kind of that next level move uh, that a lot of people wouldn't think about because after the knight takes here on g6 uh, carjuana's okay with giving up his bishop here on h2 giving up both of his bishops which is pretty rare but he does it because he doesn't want his opponent to have a double bishop pair and he's willing to give up both of his knowing that right now it's a closed game for the most part he has two knights so that's going to be completely okay and although his opponent has a bishop if it's not paired with another bishop it's not as strong on board so again kind of that next level move that most people wouldn't look at he definitely found a nice little continuation. So after the king takes and the pawn takes here on g6, we're now going to see pawn here to g3. Just solidifying the structure over here on the king side a little bit more. Queen to d8, king here to g2. And then pawn here to g5. Uh, going to start to push up a little bit and put a little pressure. Again, this knight here is still just blocking off a lot of what white wants to do. If he ever wants to get his bishop or his queen involved on the king side, uh, controlling this e4 square is very, very crucial for black. And right now it's also adding another layer of defense on the square here on g5. So now we see the rook come over here to h1, recognizing that there is a semi-open file, but he can maybe push up, support this pawn with this rook right here. But both sides, it's pretty equal on both sides of the board. So again, it's kind of the first round. No one's really trying to do anything too crazy. Again, both players recognizing that they're playing some of the top right now, so they're not trying to get into any crazy variations right now playing pretty safe so pawn here to uh, b4 
pawn over here to a5, threatening and then pushing forward with b5. Uh, pretty good move right now, trying to kind of break up the center. Uh, this pawn right here on c6 is very important to this defense on uh, d5, so wants to make sure that he does not just give up that right away. Uh, pawn here to c5, pretty interesting move, and, and potentially could weaken some of his structure. Uh, this pawn here on d5 now is somewhat of a weakness, and all of a sudden, White can start to put a lot of pressure on the square here on c5. He has a pawn, he has his queen, he has his rook, so definitely something that Black's going to have to possibly worry about in the future. He has both of his knights defending it, but if all of a sudden White decides to go ahead and start sacrificing or exchanging pieces off the board, uh, Black could find himself in a, a pretty tough spot. From here, we're going to see the pawn pushing over here to h4, as we talked about, with this protection with the rook here on h1. Can definitely do that. This pawn's just going to push forward, force this knight to move. This knight does come up here to g5, and it's a nice little outpost. Uh, it's completely fine, and it's going to be awkward. Black really can't take with it. Uh, he could take with his knight right here, uh, but then the pawn's going to take, and then it's just super awkward from here. So the rook's... You know, he wants to come up here. The bishop can come up here if he wants to. So, you know, if we see queen to g5, now bishop here to h7, uh, that's going to be bad. You don't want to have your king come to h8 because then you have a discovered attack when the the bishop moves. If the king comes up here to f8, uh, then all of a sudden you can have bishop back here to f5 attacking this knight. This knight is in a lot of trouble. It's now again defending this one square here on c5. And if it moves, if it tries to stay safe with knight to b6, then all of a sudden queen to c5 is check and this knight's going to fall. So that's going to be bad. Even if we saw, you know, king to e7, uh, making sure that the bishop just can't take right here. Uh, then the bishop could take immediately and even after the king takes, we could see the pawn take here on c5. And then all of a sudden the king's in the center of the board can really start to push forward with these pawns. It's going to be very, very difficult for black to continue here. So if we come back here, instead of taking this, uh, Black recognizes his little weakness that he has here uh, with c5, kind of looking at the variation that I looked at, uh, and so he plays rook over here to c8. So, so nice little move from Fabiano, recognizing the complications and playing the smarter move to play rook over here to c8, protecting this pawn, the semi-open file that White kind of has some pressure on. We now see the bishop exchange right here on e4, uh, which again, as we talked about the strings for black, controlling this square right here on e4 was very, very valuable. So white didn't have the double bishop pair, so decided it was now just a good time. His light square bishop wasn't doing anything much at all, so he decided it'd be a great time to go ahead and exchange. Uh, so pawn taking here on e4, probably a better exchange for white, I think. Uh, queen here to b3, this does kind of open up the door after this pawn here on d5. Uh, so again, good for, for white in my opinion. Uh, pawn here to a g6, rook up here to c4. Pawn here to b6, just trying to solidify the pawn chain over here. Uh, that's okay. Rook over here to c1. So white's pretty much given up on the king side. It's going to be pretty tough to do a whole lot. Uh, this pawn can't push up any further. Uh, the knight would just fall. So starting to look over here on the queen side. The pawn can take if you wanted here on c5. Can try to really break things up. We now see the rook over here to d8. Uh, again, there could be a weakness here if the pawn wanted to take. Uh, this knight could get involved if he wanted to. Uh, white decides to go and just start blowing stuff up. So pawn taking here on c5. Uh, we do see an exchange. Uh, and then Sergei decides that he wants to go and start giving up some material for a very very strong attack so all of a sudden black is now up in material but white has a pass pawn here on b5 which can be very very dangerous and he has two very very active pieces an active piece over here with his knight on g5 although right now it's not clear how he's going to use that uh, this pawn here on e4 is very very well defended uh, and the pawn here on f7 is kind of blocking it right here so eventually this could be very very good for white but right now he's kind of focused on on pushing this pawn because pawns are always meant to be pushed and also trying to get very very aggressive with these two pieces right here 
Carwana plays a rook over here to c8. He's completely fine exchanging material off. So anytime you're up in material, you want to just exchange down to the bare minimum because you're going to be ahead and it's going to be a very, very end game, very easy end game. Uh, White's not ready to do that, so he's going to play rook over here to e5. You know, black can't just take here because it's going to be a checkmate pretty soon. Uh, so that's going to be bad. Fabiano's obviously not going to do that. Instead, plays queen here to f6. Not only threatening this rook here on e5, but also putting some pressure here on f2. Uh, just kind of keeping his opponent honest. Uh, we now see rook over here to d5, uh, which is fine. Uh, then rook over here to d8. Again, as we said, Fabiano's completely okay exchanging material off the board. It wouldn't be too bad, though, uh, if there was an exchange. The rook taking here on d8, uh, and then taking here, and then the queen coming back here to c2. This would be fine. Uh, in the actual game, though, there's a huge blunder. Sergei actually decided to play pawn here to a4. And from here, it was pretty much over. So after the exchange... Uh, the queen recaptures, and then rook down here to c2. There's no way now to protect this pawn here on f2, and, and white's just completely lost. It doesn't really matter what this queen does. He could come up here and try to check his opponent, but it's going to be very, very easy for this king to stay safe. Uh, so the king's going to come back here to h1 uh, because, you know, queen to f2 would be pretty, pretty easy. Uh, but after rook to f2, Sergei Carjuana, Cardiacin, uh, was forced to resign. And Fabiano Carjuana, uh, wins the first game as the black pieces versus probably one of the, the best competitors in the field. So huge blunder at the end after a really, really close and entertaining game. So, Again, really, really excited for this tournament and all the different tournaments in this Grand Prix. But Fabio Carjuana is just on a tear right now. Just anyone he plays, he is just dominating. So really, really cool to see this 22-year-old. If you've seen a lot of my other videos, I've pretty much said that he will be the number one player to possibly beat Magnus Cross. I still think Magnus Cross right now is far and away the best player. He's just ridiculous at all forms of chess, speed chess, bullet chess. Uh, he's kind of the guy. But um, at 22, Fabiano is super young. He's super talented. He studies the game more than anyone else. Very similar to kind of Fisher back in the day when all he did was study. So really, really cool to see him. I think he's going to dominate this tournament. I think he's going to dominate the Grand Prix. I think he's going to win the Candidates Tournament. And then in two years, I think him and Magnus Carlsen are going to have one of the more epic battles at the World Championship. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Um, I'm excited to have a few more exciting games from the Grand Prix over the next couple weeks so definitely check back there uh, but hopefully you guys enjoyed hopefully you learned something and i'll see you guys in the next video thanks for watching